Hi, everybody, um, and thanks for joining us. This is episode two. We did a program uh, a month ago with uh, Drs. Petrolak and Gartrell and Grievous and myself. And, you know, I was thinking about it, how we talk about living in, you know, dog years or light years. I think we're living in COVID years, right? I mean, so much has, uh, has transformed in the last month. And, uh, you know, so many of us are, are now becoming health policy experts and quasi-virologists in addition to being uh, ensconced in our normal uh, research and, and dedication to GU oncology. So it's an incredibly remarkable time. Um, I'm really glad that uh, many of you are tuning into the second uh, program. As already said, uh, there are archival opportunities to get that program and then this program again. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Neil Shore. I'm the director of the Carolina Urologic uh, Research Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, we really hope you find this program interesting. So let me just do an introduction of our, our colleagues uh, for now. We have a phenomenal group. Um, I'll begin with um, uh, Dr. Benjamin uh, Gartrell, and, and, and Ben is the director of the Genitourinary Malignancy Program at Montefiore. And he's an associate uh, professor of oncology and urology at uh, Albert Einstein Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Petrus Grievous is the clinical director of the University of Washington Medicine's uh, genital urinary cancer program. He's also affiliated with Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, uh, amicably, or we like to call the Hutch, and Seattle Cancer uh, Care Alliance. And, uh, and Dan Petrolak is professor of medicine, and medical oncology, and urology at Yale Cancer Center. Uh, you see, we're all, you know, so happy that you're here and, and happy that you can, you know, share your wisdom. And, and what's sort of really interesting is, you know, looking at, you know, Connecticut, you know, New York City, Washington, myself, and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We're still having some different experiences regarding uh, the, um, the infectivity rates and how we're opening up. And, you know, so we see potentially some global or not global, but regional and local and institutional differences of how we're being told to uh, adapt to, to the, the, the COVID pandemic. And so I think that'll continue to be an interesting dialogue for us today. Uh, here you see some of our faculty disclosures. So these are always important, but you can go through those and, and see those later on as well. Um, we're really very appreciative to the folks at BioAscend. It's being uh, brought to uh, all of you through their hard work. It's a BioAscend is an independent medical education company, and it's committed to supporting healthcare uh, providers in their efforts to translate innovative science into clinical practice, which is really the the key to a, a dedicated physician scientist um, ethos. So let's get started. Uh, and what we see here, here's our title, our second episode today. And I think today's program will be a balance of some, some really interesting research science that's happening. I know Dan Petrolak and, and Petros and Ben are involved in this. I, I am as well. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the clinical practicalities or, 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 as to what's happening. And in, in a moment or two, we're going to begin with, with uh, uh, Petros going into a, a really tremendously um, informative uh, uh, ASCO virtual presentation uh, about some, you know, really top end data that has been put together through a consortium on cancer care and COVID. But as you can see here in this slide, you know, here's from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, here are some of the things that are, you know, impacting all of us uh, with the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think near and dear to all of us is this issue around clinical trials and research, and we'll get into that. Uh, are we delaying uh, diagnosis? Uh, are, are patients, you know, evolving in their staging? This obviously is of, of critical uh, anxiety and fear to our patients that we serve. Uh, are we doing screening at the rates that we're used to doing? Uh, are we able to take some of the learnings of uh, when to screen and when not to screen and make it advantageous during, uh, you know, high infectivity rates? Uh, and how will this impact us in the future? I, I find that particularly fascinating. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, we're all learning how to be health policy aficionados and how will this impact us should we get a second wave? So I'm 
looking forward to the faculty's comments on that. Um, the disruption to clinical trials, you know, getting the monitoring in, the costs associated with clinical trials, starting new clinical trials. I mean, that's the mother's milk of academic medicine is clinical research and clinical trials. And, um, you know, how will that impact us and how will it impact overall cancer epidemiology if we are not, t uh, if we're not judiciously taking care of our patients in a timely way? So um, with that, let me um, uh, stop and, and hand it over to uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Grievous. And so this was a really a, a, a tremendous amount of up-to-date contemporaneous data that uh, with, a, with a wonderful uh, assortment of, of, of uh, participants. So uh, please tell us about it, Petros. Thank you so much, Neil, for the great introduction. And thanks to Biosen for putting us together here and uh, uh, keeping us uh, uh, in the second episode on track. Hopefully we'll have more information as we uh, get through this journey and adventure of COVID-19 and we're learning together in this, as you pointed out. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, this wonderful presentation that Dr. Jeremy Warner performed at the virtual meeting, as you said, Neil, a few days ago, uh, uh, presenting data from the consortium we formed uh, about 80 days ago, literally in the middle of March. Uh, it's amazing how quickly things uh, go together and uh, that we're able uh, to publish the paper in Lancet, as well as have this presentation at ASHWAN, our meeting, uh, and we'll present you today, share with you some key highlights of this effort uh, from the COVID-19 and Cancer Consortium, CC19, uh, what was a late-breaking abstract at the ASCO meeting. Uh, next slide. So it's interesting these days that uh, uh, we are actually working hard every day but many of us are active in social media and actually this consortium uh, appears to be a, a direct product from social media activity. What happened was many of us were uh, exchanging uh, opinions and questions and uh, potential answers in, in Twitter. And uh, this dialogue uh, that was actually spearheaded by a very uh, prominent junior uh, uh, scientist, Dr. Akash Desai, um, and uh, this uh, dialogue became an email uh, group listing, and through that, we decided to form this consortium, the CC19, aiming to uh, collect and disseminate prospective, granular, and uniformly organized information on people with cancer who are also diagnosed with COVID-19. And we try to have a very rapid dissemination of information using crowdsourcing uh, as uh, fast as possible and with high granularity and scalability as well. Uh, you can see our logo as well as Twitter handle. This slide uh, shows how quickly we grew and uh, from this uh, Twitter dialogue, now we have more than 100 sites, more than 100 institutions in the United States only. And uh, I can tell you right now, we're approaching 2,500 surveys. Each one of them, uh, um, uh, corresponds to an individual patient. And we have sites also in Canada and as well as in Europe, and I will show you in the next slides um, what exactly uh, we do. Uh, the hypothesis has been that patients with cancer may have a higher risk of uh, worse outcomes with COVID-19 due to uh, more senior age, higher burden of medical comorbidities, uh, a healthcare, uh, healthcare system uh, frequent contacts because these patients may come in frequently for uh, blood work, CAT scans, uh, treatment, so on and so forth. They may be immunocompromised, some more than others, depending on the uh, cancer type as well as what treatment they get for the cancer, and many of them may have um, um, impaired functional status. Next slide. So the methodology we used, as I mentioned before, was crowdsourcing. We tried to create a survey that was actually informed by real-time data that we're reading in the literature and uh, we're uh, trying to understand uh, better the emerging uh, data as was coming in. We uh, uh, formed this survey and we asked different investigators in different institutions uh, to fill out this survey, providers were filling out the surveys in order to ask, uh, to answer uh, very important questions regarding demographics, baseline characteristics, as well as uh, cancer uh, stage, uh, grade, uh, treatment uh, patterns of the cancer, other historical details, cancer related, 
as well as COVID-19 related information, uh, how uh, was the patient diagnosed, uh, how the uh, uh, COVID-19 illness um, progressed, and what treatment the patient received for COVID-19. Then we also looked at outcomes, um, important outcomes like mortality at 30 days and beyond, um, uh, mechanical ventilation, ICU admission, hospitalization, and, and oxygen use requirement, uh, among many other uh, uh, interesting endpoints. And as you see in that particular slide, we used uh, a priori um, uh, hypothesis with a, a, a set of variables that we thought they were relevant, biologically and clinically, and based on the data, data-driven work, uh, and we used logistic regression with partial adjustment and, and multi-imputation for potential missing data. Next slide. Uh, in this diagram, you see the uh, totality of the patients that were actually included in the Lancet publication, as well as the presentation by Dr. Warner at the ASCO annual meeting. A few days ago, we had 1,035 surveys. Uh, again, this corresponds to uh, patients. And we had some exclusion, as you see in that slide, and we ended up having uh, uh, actual data and usable data from 928 patients. As I mentioned, uh, the, at the time we did the analysis, we're about, uh, I would say, uh, uh, a month and a half or so, uh, maybe two months after the initiation of the consortium. So I'm actually impressed how quickly uh, the team got together. Uh, you see that there were about half and half men and women, and uh, you see the age distribution in that slide with a median age of 66 years. Next slide. You see the different uh, uh, racial ethnic distribution. This slide is very relevant to what is happening in this country nowadays. Uh, we talk about healthcare disparities, and of course, COVID-19 is one great example of how healthcare disparities uh, can appear, and that's a, a very, very sobering moment, I think, for all of us, and we're going to discuss later. Uh, in our study, the majority of patients were Caucasian, as we've seen that slide. Next one. Uh, eight, about 8-2% eight, of patients had solid tumors. Some of them had dermatological malignancies, and uh, about 12% had more than one cancer. Most common were breast cancer and prostate cancer, as you see, followed by GI cancers, lymphoma, thoracic malignancies, and multi myeloma. Next slide. So, I did a quick interruption. Were you surprised, uh, Petros, that you didn't see more lung cancer? Yeah, good question, uh, Neil. So, this thoracic here is the fifth uh, more common, uh, includes lung cancer, to your point. I would expect, as you said, to have higher um, uh, uh, sample size in terms of patients with lung cancer because lung cancer is, you know, one of the most common cancer to begin with. And then when you think about COVID-19 and respiratory illness, uh, that could potentially be a risk factor. Uh, I think it's worth noting that there is a separate completely effort called TerraVault uh, that was also presented at the ASCO annual meeting by Dr. Leora Horn from Vanderbilt that actually focused on thoracic malignancies. So one potential explanation that these patients may have been enrolled to this terrible registry and not that many to our, our own registry. That's a great, great pickup, Neil. Uh, in terms of the performance status and the cancer status in that slide, uh, you see that the majority of patients in our registry had an ECOG PS0 to 1, uh, and uh, about half of them had their cancer in remission. So we had an actual balance for our statistics to see, to compare patients who had cancer in remission versus uh, present cancer, meaning vi uh, visible, measurable on the scans. Uh, and the measurable cancer was uh, uh, further uh, subdivided in the category of stable disease or progressing disease, which I think is important in our analysis. And a small proportion of patients, uh, only 8%, had an equal PS of 2, which we know is a negative prognostic factor across different cancers. Next slide. So overall, uh, the mortality at 30 days at one month was 13%. That it appears double uh, from what we see in the literature in other data sets, not in, uh, necessarily in patients with cancer. Uh, so uh, a priori, I can say that uh, cancer seems to be uh, a, a something that might be related to higher uh, mortality uh, compared to uh, patients without cancer. Again, without having a paired comparison in our database, this is uh, just an indirect comparison with the literature. 12% uh, had a uh, requirement for mechanical ventilation, 14% went to the ICU, about a quarter 
had what we call a composite outcome, which uh, is, is com uh, comprised of different, uh, consists of different uh, endpoints, uh, including mechanical ventilation, ICU admission, hospitalization, um, oxygen requirement, and hospitalization about half of the patients in our cohort. Next slide. So in, in terms of the specific groups here, is as you see, uh, male gender, uh, we have 17% mortality. Uh, people who are 75 or older, 25% uh, mortality at one month. Uh, progressing cancer, not stable, but progressing, 25% mortality at one month. Equal PS of two, uh, we know it's a bad prognostic factor in many cancers. In this patient population, one out of three patients with equal PS of two died. Uh, all, uh, more senior uh, patients intubated, about 60% mortality. And if someone had both ECOG PS of 2 and was intubated, 85% one, uh, one month mortality. So very high number for this a very vulnerable population of poor performance status, ECOG PS of 2 uh, uh, who were intubated. Next slide. And this slide shows X factors associated with 30-day uh, uh, all-cause mortality, uh, mortality from any cause. Older age, as we know from other data sets, male gender, men more likely to die than women. Uh, smoking is a bad thing uh, uh, for everything, as we know, and uh, this is also the case in the COVID-19 story. Equal PS of 2, as I mentioned, negative prognostic factor here. Uh, if the cancer was present, even if it was stable, it was a uh, higher risk of death compared to uh, a cancer remission. That was an interesting finding. So the presence of cancer by itself was a risk factor, especially if it was progressive. So progressive malignancy, five uh, times higher risk of third day mortality. And uh, the last one I would uh, always say, we have to take it with a grain of salt, huge grain of salt, is that the combination of hydroxychloroquine uh, plus azathromycin combination was associated uh, with uh, a high risk of third day mortality. I have to say here, of course, that there may be confounding factors. This might be confounded by indication and severity. In simple words, you know, patients were more sick and you know could die for other reasons, could potentially have higher chance to receive this combination. And uh, that's why we cannot say for sure whether the combination uh, was um, associated with uh, higher mortality um, uh, itself or it was confounded by other factors. So we have to take this finding with a grain of salt. Next slide. These are factors that did not reach statistical significance, that did not significantly associate with third day mortality. And this included the uh, non Hispanic black versus non Hispanic white. Obesity was not uh, a risk factor in our cohort for mortality. The tumor type was not, uh, chemotherapy was not, and that's an important thing for our discussion. So I talk chemotherapy versus no, uh, there was no significant risk. And uh, non toxic therapy versus non so there was no significant high risk here uh, for third day mortality. Next slide. So if I, if I could yeah. just interrupt for a second, Petra. So that that's so far, and to me, and I'd love to hear Ben and Dan what you think. But that 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 the the, the chemo, the cytotoxic chemo versus none, that was not statistically significant. That's counterintuitive, pretty much to every a lot of the literature that we we read about, right? And during COVID, that. If you're immunocompromised, neutropenic, um, that you're going to be particularly uh, at risk for COVID uh, if you're getting growth factors. So, how do you how do you how do you think about that? That's a great point, uh, Neil. And, and uh, just for context, I want to point out that the different database, the Teravol database, actually reported uh, something different. A point that uh, uh, chemotherapy uh, alone or with other therapy was associated with higher risk of bad outcomes in the patients with thoracic malignancies. I think, uh, you know, our database uh, was, I would say, larger, including multiple tumor types and uh, had a higher sample size and uh, multiple different, of course, chemotherapy regimens as well as other therapies. I think in, in, uh, we are continuing the following up here. We're going to have probably triple uh, the size of this cohort in future analysis. To, and we're going to look again at that question. But my take on this so far is, and, and Dan and, and Ben can comment, is that if a patient requires systemic therapy for their cancer, they have a need, an urgent need for treatment, I would feel more comfortable with this data continuing my practice, which is go ahead and treat the patient. 
Uh, and this again includes patients who need treatment for their malignancies. Uh, but I would like to hear what Dan and, and Ben think about it. Well, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting that you lump immune therapy, targeted therapy, endocrine therapy, and radiation together. Um, you know, I'm not sure that that, you know, in, in terms of some observations that have been made with hormone therapy that, that may actually reduce the risk. So that may be a little bit confounding. So it, it may be a little bit difficult to lump everything together in one one type of situation. Uh, you know, chemotherapy is, is, is very, very different in terms of its uh, uh, induction of a neutropenia. I mean, oral cytoxan versus something like intravenous uh, uh, MVAC or cisplatin-based chemotherapy, that's going to have a very, very different effect on the body. So I, I, I think that um, it's very, very, I mean, I think you've done a great job with this, but it's very, very difficult to dis dissect this out. You know, I, I agree. I think it is counterintuitive, um, but I will also say that our, at our own institution in Montefiore, you know, we published um, our own patient um, outcomes, our cancer patients who had COVID, and we had about 218 patients. And we also didn't see any correlation between chemotherapy and survival, which um, I, I think it is surprising. And I, I do agree with you, Petrus, that I feel more comfortable now um, continuing chemotherapy on my patients if we feel they truly require it. I think we'll talk more later about maybe considering alternatives if we have them, but it does make me feel more comfortable treating with chemo. Petros, are you going to show us data? Uh, is there any kind of subset analysis of uh, metropolitan versus rural areas or academic tertiary centers for community centers with any of this data? Neil, you raised some great questions and uh, I think this will come in the future. I can share with you that we have uh, very uh, 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 real discussions this week with our colleagues in the steering committee of the CCC19 to try to answer those questions. We're very interested again in this uh, question about rural versus uh, you know, more tertiary centers, academic versus community, uh, because we want to uh, get an angle on this healthcare disparities question and whether there are differences there, access to care, of course, another confounding factor. So with more, you know, going back to Dan's point, with higher sample size, we're going to answer more granularly these questions and get to your point, Neil, about rural versus more urban areas, as well as different you know, academic versus community centers. We're also trying to expand geographically and uh, this particular effort included US, Canada, and Spain, so three different countries, but we're now working with ESMO and we try to actually have multiple countries as well with dif different healthcare systems to have a little bit more global approach to this. And uh, stay tuned, but hopefully we'll be able to present some data. As I always say, we wish we had zero cases, but we all know that this is not the case, but, and we're going to try to capture as much as we can. So to conclude and, and, and uh, uh, get uh, all of you to, to generate more discussion, uh, I think this consortium uh, showed that patients with cancer had a 13%, 1-3% mortality of 30 days, uh, which is definitely concerning. At the same time, uh, uh, there were general factors like older age, male gender, poor performance status, stable and even more progressing cancer associated with uh, mortality. Uh, I think the finding of the hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine plus astrozomycin combination merits further investigation because of the multiple confounding factors there. Uh, we need more more data to, to comment on that. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, I think with uh, with uh, uh, the, this data set, as Ben mentioned before, I feel comfortable when I see a patient in front of me uh, who needs treatment, I feel comfortable go ahead and give systemic therapy, either chemotherapy if it's necessary or immunotherapy or other therapies, antibody drug conjugates. And to, to Dan, uh, Dan's point, I, with, uh, with more numbers, we can try to dissect down uh, particular individual therapies. That's, that's for the future. Uh, but uh, overall, I would say uh, it's, it's, it's a beginning. Uh, hopefully, we'll get more data in the future. But we'll try to contribute as much as we can in this uh, vulnerable population of patients with cancer. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss this with you today. Yeah, no, I mean, so congratulations. I mean, what a what a, a great collaborative effort. What a huge effort to get this type of data, this contemporaneous data so quickly and get it presented and also published. So congratulations. Um, let me ask uh, you both uh, all, or all three of you, maybe we start first with, with Dan, then Ben, then Petros. 
So you already commented, and it's interesting. From a month ago, we we there, it seemed to be you know no you know no immunosuppressive therapies. You know uh, you know it's you know avoid them, avoid them, avoid them, especially uh, uh, you know uh, chemotherapies. And and there is now a clearly uh, some suggestion that if done correctly, patients can receive this safely. But uh, I wanted to ask you before we went on and, and give Dan Petrolak, I know wants to talk about some other clinical trial work that's that's really very, very current and very interesting as it relates to um, uh, androgen ablations. Um, can you comment right now in your locales, you know, the accessibility to testing, and by testing, I mean PCR testing, and how that's being done at your institutions if at all, the accessibility to it, and how the, that accessibility is being utilized vis-a-vis -vis coming to clinic, going for procedures, or starting any treatment. And then even also potentially, if you have someone who's under your care who has been positive, how are you dealing with them uh, in terms of uh, convalescing from the treatment from their COVID before you institute additional treatment. So I, I gave you a bunch of things to talk about. I know we only have a little bit of time. So, so think about that. And let me start with you first, Dan. How, how, how's, it, how's it changed in the last month? So um, you can get the test a little bit more readily. We have a special clinic. It's a clinic we refer patients to. If we suspect they have COVID, this way we're trying to separate them out from the general population. All of our nurses screen the patients the day before for travel history. Uh, for any history of fevers, any history of any family members that are infected, everybody, all healthcare workers, have their temperature taken as they move as they go into the into the clinic area. Uh, so we're we're doing that particular preventative measure. We are still not screening healthcare workers uh, for COVID beforehand. All of our patients before a surgical procedure are screened. On the oncology ward, we are still separate from the Smilo Hospital. So Smilo Hospital. Uh, became basically a COVID center because of the negative pressure rooms. Uh, and our clinic, which was on the fourth floor, was moved to North Haven, and the ward service for oncology was moved over to St. Raphael's Hospital, which is a Yale affiliate within the town of New Haven. So uh, so the patients still for oncology are still at St. Rafe's. This is a, a quote-unquote COVID-free hospital uh, where all the uh, surgical procedures are being done right now. The question is when they're going to be moving back. We are moving back to our clinic in Smilo next week. So so that's sort of coming back uh, to where we were before. Uh, but again, um, we are screening our patients heavily before, for procedures. Those oncology patients that are ill uh, are checked for COVID before they come to the uh, come to the wards. And yeah, so I will say that um, we really have a, a quite robust capacity for testing at Montefiore, and I'm really proud of what the institution has been able to do. So right now we are testing all new visits uh, in the outpatient setting um, two days before with a PCR test. And for patients that are on active therapy, we're testing them. There's a little bit of heterogeneity, but approximately uh, monthly. And for um, any faculty member or any staff within oncology, we can be tested essentially whenever we want. Um, so there really is a robust capacity. For patients that have previously been COVID positive, um, one thing we found is that if we test too soon, they're going to be positive again on PCR. So generally we try to allow three weeks and then we test on two consecutive days because the tests un unfortunately aren't perfect and there are false negatives. So we require patients to be, if they were positive, negative twice. And uh, we're also testing for antibodies both in staff and also in patients. So in the context of patients who have previously been exposed and were previously PCR positive, we are doing antibody testing in all of these patients. And as Dan said, you know, we are screening all patients and staff as they walk into our building. There's only a single port of entry and um, all patients are being called the day prior to any visit to screen them for any COVID symptoms. Great, Charles. Uh, Neil, I, I, I have to uh, pretty much re uh, repeat and, uh, uh, what uh, Dan and Ben just said because we do uh, almost the same things uh, here. Uh, I don't want to uh, duplicate what has been said, but uh, uh, some unique features I would say in our center is uh, at, at our um, clinical trial side, uh, we had to close individual clinical trials 
uh, because of COVID-19 in a risk-benefit uh, scenario. And uh, uh, right now we're in the process of slowly uh, uh, opening up those clinical trials, but it was very individualized and in the GU uh, team, uh, I would say that about 80% of trials remained open to accrual because the benefits outweigh the risks in our uh, adjustment based on the uh, particular COVID-19 uh, peak in Seattle was lower than expected, so we had the opportunity to give main trials open. Uh, but, but now we're trying to open pretty much everything else we're in that process. Uh, I think by the next week or so, we should be uh, opening up all the trials. The other uh, extra feature is that at the HATS, the, the laboratory part of the cancer center, uh, every single employee is getting tested and uh, by, by uh, the molecular test, the PCR test. Uh, this has not been the case with the clinical center, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, but as uh, uh, Ben mentioned, everybody uh, is getting screened at the uh, one entry uh, that we have uh, for symptoms, uh, fever, and many other symptoms, and uh, we, everybody's wearing a mask. So this is a mandatory uh, thing in the clinical space, both patients and providers. We're also trying to be creative because they, sometimes the rooms, the working rooms are small. So you have many people in a small room, like providers, nurses, uh, uh, so on and so forth, uh, research coordinators. So we try to be creative and create more spaces and create some shifts during the day uh, so we can decrease the amount of time and, uh, of that many people are in the same room and decrease the density, which is not easy, but we try to be creative with that idea from the operational standpoint. And, and the last thing I would say is that uh, every patient who is getting an operating procedure, uh, they get COVID-19 testing before that. Uh, we have not tested everybody getting chemotherapy unless they have symptoms, uh, but everybody gets a phone call before the visit uh, to ask for symptoms and get it screened that way. So significant overlap with my colleagues. Yeah, so um, it, it is interesting. There, there seems to be, so I, I won't repeat, I, we, we're doing pretty much everything that all three of you just said. The testing has finally become accessible really in the last seven to 10 days. All of our patients undergoing procedures in hospital and in our outpatient surgery center, which it sounds like are, in all of your institutions are getting tested. Interestingly, we have a seem we all seemingly are, are practicing more clinical judgment in patients coming in for systemic therapies vis-a-vis -vis their travel exposure, cough history, temperature, or any other risk factors. So it, it's not as binary as, the, as certainly interventional surgical patients, uh, which seems to be the the case I think for most of the country. But I, I don't know that it's across the country right now. Uh, I'll just put a, what we're doing a trial, we're working through the protocol. We're gonna be looking at about a thousand patients across the country uh, at various um, uh, urologic, medical oncology, radiation oncology sites. We're gonna be doing prospective uh, twice week PCR testing uh, as well as uh, uh, serology testing. And if patients are become positive at any given point, they'll obviously quarantine, we'll have home testing organized for them as well. We're really looking at the healthcare worker population. And so it'll include, you know, med onks, uro, urologists, rad onks, but also nurses, medical assistants, front office people, lab techs. And because those are seemingly the, the folks who are even more at risk. So I'm really excited about us doing that. We're gonna hopefully start that in the first or second week of July. We're working on an extension study to see what happens to the patients who convert. So to your credit, Petros, we're, a lot of us uh, are working on these contemporaneous populations to see how it all is going to evolve. But uh, Dan, let me throw this back to you. I know you, you've been working on some, uh, some studies and you've been participating and I think probably all of us were uh, participants at a recent uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation a forum, and there's been some real interesting sort of counterintuitive uh, uh, results that we're seeing in men who are on T suppression uh, and their their effects of COVID. So, so Dan, I know you're really you're very involved in this. So, um, we actually have a fairly large network within Yale that we're going to be doing some trials, and um, the, um, the the very very interesting thing that it was an observation that was made actually early on. Uh, by the Italian group that uh, uh, that the relative risk of, 
of uh, severe infections of COVID uh, was much, much lower in men with metastatic prostate cancer who were undergoing androgen blockade than either prostate cancer patients who had local therapy and were not on hormones or the general cancer population. And then that was compared to the overall population. It was somewhere around 70 severe episodes per 300,000 patients. So um, it was very interesting. There was some very, very good presentations today from PCF that looked at um, a number of different trials. The VA right now is going to be opening up a trial of Degarelix in hospitalized patients uh, who uh, uh, are COVID positive to see if that's going to affect their hospitalization. Uh, there are a number of studies looking at various anti-androgens uh, that uh, to prevent or at least giving these early on. The thought is is that TEMPRS-2 is upregulated in patients with uh, uh, with COVID or uh, prostate cancer, and this is actually one of the two mechanisms by which the virus enters the normal cell. Um, TEMPRS-2 is an androgen-dependent uh, uh, gene. So a number of people are looking at different variations of antiandrogens or hormone therapy, um, as well as other agents to potentially prevent viral entry. So I think that there's going to be some very interesting studies ahead. You know, again, the question is whether there's going to be a second wave or not. Let's hope that we, you know, can uh, at least get our answers quickly uh, based upon first wave, and hopefully there won't be a second wave. So that makes me think of a couple of different questions, and maybe Ben, if you could answer this, because I think that it may be fair to say that you've been really right in the epicenter of, of the, 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 the hot seat globally, being in New York City. Um, as it, I want to ask you two things. One, uh, just about just general equipment issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis preparing for a second wave. And as most of the history would tell us, we can highly likely that we'll see a second or potentially third wave. We're all obviously hoping we don't see that. But what are some of the things that you're doing, you know, differently vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, your your institution? I mean, at one point there was a tremendous worry that there weren't going to be enough ventilators. Uh, you know, we saw the 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 comfort. I think it was the 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 ship that was at the comfort of the mercy docked in New York Harbor, Javits Center in New York was converted into, uh, you know, a, a quasi-hospital system, you know, make makeshift uh, uh, hospital, uh, quasi-intensive uh, you know, care in Central Park. So what what's a little bit different now for you and your institution regarding that? And then the second half of my question for everybody is, as you mentioned the data about using Degarelix in a, a trial is, just the kind of the, the the concept of parenteral versus oral medications, assuming a high infectivity rate, or or, or in patients who you're particularly worried about. So two part question, Ben, and then uh, let Petros answer, and then Dan. Yeah, sure. I'll just say that put it in perspective of what we were dealing with at the peak. Um, within the Montefiore network of hospitals, we had 1,940 or so patients with um, COVID admitted at one time. Um, right now, we're down to 165 patients, so that's an over 90% reduction. Um, at our worst, within our three hospitals in the Bronx, we had 241 patients with COVID on ventilators, and we were seeing 500 COVID positive patients daily in our emergency departments. So it was really overwhelming and it truly felt like the system may be um, at the breaking point, but fortunately we never got there. I think it had a lot to do with um, preparedness, but also with um, social distancing and flattening the, the curve, which was exceedingly effective and prevented us from being completely overwhelmed. Um, to put it also in perspective, um, at, our, at our major academic center, our, our grand hall was converted into an inpatient unit. So where we would normally have grand rounds, we instead had patients admitted with COVID. Um, we converted multiple um, non-inpatient facilities, inpatient facilities, and we had to create several new intensive care units. So, you know, we saw things that were really unthinkable, but, you know, the, the, the system never um, um, was overwhelmed, and every patient that needed care got the care that they needed. Um, I will say this, we've been looking through our data for patients uh, with prostate cancer treated with androgen deprivation. And we're in the process of forming a collaboration with other institutions within New York to share that data. Um, I've uh, looked through the data that I have initially for my prostate cancer patients, and I, I don't see any obvious benefit from androgen deprivation. But the truth is that those patients were much more likely to have metastatic disease than patients that weren't on androgen deprivation. So I think it's going to take very large numbers to try to figure out if there's truly a benefit 
or if there's not a benefit. Um, but I will just say at our institution, and this is remarkable, but 28% of our patients with cancer who were COVID positive died of COVID. And that's remarkable. It's about twice what um, Petrus had, had quoted. And even more shocking, 46% of our patients that were 75 or older died of COVID, which is just you know, really almost unimaginable. These are these are very very sad numbers and very high numbers, Ben, for sure. And uh, I'm sure there are multiple different factors potentially explaining that. You know, severity of comorbidities. Uh, but it sounds like that the healthcare system there did not reach the capacity from what you are saying. That was the concern we had. Um, well, we had capacity actually. So we were we were much um, beyond capacity. The governor had actually instructed that all New York City hospitals had to increase inpatient beds by two to three fold. So that's what we did. So we, you know, normally like most um, hospitals, we run near capacity, and now we were running at two to three times capacity by essentially uh, creating additional new care care facilities. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's just the overwhelming number of patients there. I think Dan had a comment. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, we had so, sort of actually our our uh, uh, population was sort of heterogeneous down in Greenwich, which is part of our system. Uh, we had a high number, a much much higher number of patients in the ICU, and we were close to capacity. We were at capacity in New Haven, and that did not reach the same uh, uh, dire proportions that it did down in Greenwich. Uh, we're, we're we flattened. We're our numbers are going down pretty dramatically, so we're we're happy to see that. So I think that uh, uh, it's a common phenomenon we're seeing across the board. The interesting thing is up in Greenwich and, and uh, throughout uh, Connecticut, uh, the restaurants are open and they're opening the streets up for people to eat outside. Uh, it's actually quite a nice thing to see. So uh, it's it's moving forward. Golf courses are open. Uh, so that's a nice thing as well. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to comment on that. So we we've we've opened up. We were in South Carolina. We were one of the earlier states to open up. And of course, uh, we were pretty good, actually, in terms of our distancing and a lot of good education about that. But um, what I've noticed, to be quite frank, and I, I, it is um, a, a sort of a rebound effect uh, that I'm not seeing in our healthcare facilities, but I'm seeing it out in the community. A yeah. lot of use of um, distancing, uh, now with this nicer weather, less distancing, less use of masks. Um, and you know you you see these isolated moments, especially with the good with the warm weather. The warm weather places, I think, are going to be really at, at risk. Um, uh, how are you uh, dealing with that within your within your own environments, especially with your your, your the entirety of the healthcare worker team? Uh, is it is it just me, or do you think that there's a concern that there may become there may be a laxity because as we see the rates go down because of the benefits of distancing, we see the nice weather, people are just stir crazy from being uh, isolated. Do, does, is that going to come back and bite us? No, I'm personally concerned. Um, I say that you know, New York's opening up, but we essentially went from lockdown to, to protests. And um, so we've had large gatherings here in the city um, over the last week, as we've seen in you know many cities across the United States. And of course, many people are wearing masks, but others are not. And you know these are large gatherings. So I, I will just say that you know, I'm concerned. I, I definitely worry that we, uh, in a few weeks down the road, we'll be uh, paying the price for um, these exposures. Yeah, I, I've seen the same thing here. In fact. Um... You know, we, we actually, if you can believe it, we moved in the middle of a pandemic. We moved to a townhouse, and that was just an absolutely crazy experience. But in our old old building, uh, there's a huge mall outside, and people are out close to each other. They're not distancing. I think it's fine to wear to to, to go outside without a mask if you're not going to be close to somebody. I think the likelihood of, of of getting anything that way is, is extremely small. But if you're going to be close to people, I think you do need a mask. If you have friends over, uh, sit six, at least six feet away. Uh, I do that as a matter of courtesy to people that may, may be visiting us. Uh, but um, again, we keep our distance. Uh, I see laxity. I think the other th thing with healthcare workers, there are, you know, your hands get dried out, burnt. I mean, my hands were burnt from all the alcohol, and I actually had to wear bandages for a period of time uh, from washing my hands constantly. So, so again, you, 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 you there, there, there does seem to be a bit of burnout that can occur from that. 
uh, and the question is just don't let your guard down. I agree, and, and I think that uh, the concern is definitely there everywhere, and especially these days with uh, uh, the close relationship between people in this protest, not wearing a mask is definitely going to be a risk factor that uh, might actually result to, the, to exactly the opposite of you know what the intent is. This can affect COVID-19, and as we know, based on healthcare disparities, uh, communities, you know, with uh, African Americans may be disproportionately affected uh, with COVID-19. So it, I'm concerned about, you know, the, the COVID-19 resurgence uh, overall. And to, to your point, Neil, uh, you know, people have the urgency to get out because of the almost three-month lockdown. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that some uh, nor new norms of, of living and practicing are important. You know, as Dan mentioned, you know, washing hands, you know, wearing masks, uh, when needed, you know, and social distancing is very important, you know, even when we go out, you know, try to maintain as much as uh, uh, um, conscious uh, uh, hygiene measures as we can, because this virus is not going away or it's not disappearing anytime soon. Uh, here in Seattle, we had a stay at home order uh, uh, through the end of May, so just uh, until a couple of days ago, uh, just because we did not see uh, the uh, trend that we wanted to see and the governor still uh, was concerned. So uh, the numbers definitely look much better, no doubt about it, but we have to maintain our, 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 our guard and I think uh, not, not, not be too relaxed. Uh, in, in terms of your great question and, and Dan's point about uh, uh, the prostate cancer, I want to just make a quick comment. If you actually advance one slide, uh, Neil, um, I want to uh, make the point that we're trying to look at those questions, especially patients with prostate cancer in the CC19 consortium. And I put the slide there so people, if they have cases they, if they want, or they want to join our consortium, they can reach out to us. As I mentioned, Dr. Jeremy Warner is the architect of this effort in Vanderbilt and he made the presentation of ASCO. But we want to generate data, including patients with prostate cancer, try to compare different uh, uh, situations, patients with and without ADT, uh, of course, the sample size is a limitation factor here, but uh, we we'll try to get into that question with more sample size because there is some interesting rationale and hypothesis, as, as Dan mentioned. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Let me, uh, we have a, a few minutes left. This is a busy slide. This, the font's a little small, but um, this is a, a very nice paper that was uh, published uh, this year in European Urology, Stensland et al. And I think for our surgical colleagues, it has a, a very nice uh, recommendation regarding, you know, GU oncology uh, surgical procedures, where it's uh, clearly recommended what the rationale is uh, for moving forward. Um, and, and here it is on, on prostate cancer. Uh, you know, that interestingly, you see the first bullet there is, you know, there are many prostatectomy cases that can, can be safely delayed. Uh, and I think that kind of the, and we could talk about that for, you know, for a very long period of time. So much of this is having, I think, the, 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 the individualization of the patient, the patient's not only, you know, his histopathology and, and his staging, but also a really good full-throated conversation about it. I think we're all learning that patients, we all know this, they hear, they hear the cancer word, but any concepts of delay has caused a tremendous amount of anxiety for many of our patients. Uh, and so I'll switch this over into uh, looking at systemic therapies because you, you all three are, you know, really seeing so many GU medic, you know, GU uh, oncology advanced cancer patients. Uh, is there anything in particular that you've noticed or that you've changed in terms of how you dialogue with patients regarding a delay in systemic therapy. Let's assume these are all patients with metastatic disease. I can comment very quickly and then Ben and Dan can comment too. I, I personally think that uh, the cancer can be a lethal disease by itself. And uh, I'm personally worried when we delay systemic therapy, especially in the curative intent population, for example, neoadjuvant uh, setting or adjuvant setting in some patients in uh, localized bladder cancer, uh, kidney cancer, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, metastatic first-line therapy that is not curative, but can definitely result in prolonged survival, 
um, same thing in, in uh, urothelial cancer, first line therapy can, in some patients, uh, achieve long-term remissions or at least good disease control. So I would say, especially for this curative disease setting, localized disease in bladder cancer, and first line disease, metastatic urothelial and kidney cancer, when we have uh, opportunities for long-term control, I think it's very important not to delay therapy. And then uh, in subsequent lines of therapy, of course, it's discussion with the patient, but as we saw in our data sets, Progressive cancer by itself is a risk factor. So my bias has been assuming that there is, of course, great precautions in place and uh, you know a great uh, hygiene measures. I, I tend to offer systemic therapy without delays. The people who I will probably give a break are patients with great disease control, metastatic disease, kidney cancer, or urothelial cancer, and they have immunotherapy on board for a year or more. They have near CR. These are the patients I give them a break and may even switch to pembrolizumab every six weeks versus three weeks if someone is on Pembro. This is an example, but otherwise I usually tend to give treatment. Um, I agree with everything, Petrus. I, I guess I would add that for localized disease, we're often thinking, does the patient need treatment now um, or can they wait? Um, if a, a patient needs treatment now, say prostate cancer, a high-risk patient, we'll often be thinking about a bridging strategy, or at least we were during our worst, where we might give a period of androgen deprivation therapy of course, you know, we weren't able to offer things like um, radical cystectomy. So a bridging strategy would be a neoadjuvant chemotherapy if we thought it was indicated for patients. For patients with metastatic disease with prostate cancer, very comfortable starting androgen deprivation. Obviously, for a metastatic germ cell or, you know, urothelial carcinoma patient, we're not going to delay initiation of systemic therapy. For a patient with metastatic renal cell carcinoma in the front line, I'm using a lot of combination of PKI with an immunotherapy. I really like relying initially on the oral therapies, maybe beginning exit nip, and then when it's, I believe it's safe, and then the um, benefits outweigh the risks of COVID exposure, we'll bring the patients in to begin um, pembrolizumab. And even then we'll try to take advantage of the new um, six week course of pembrolizumab to minimize exposures. Yeah, the, the only thing I would, I mean, I, I agree with all that. So the only thing I've been a little bit cautious about is, if we're starting somebody new on Pembro, I probably will. I go with the with the three week schedule first, and then if they're stable on it, I'll I'll go with it. I'm not I've not used it that much yet, uh, but we've we've converted a lot of people over. We've converted a lot of people over to six month LHRH injections. Um, this is you know with Neil's data with the oral agent uh, Regurelix. Uh, I think that that may actually be a very very big opportunity. Uh, a because of the potential cardiovascular improvement of a B because you don't have patients coming in constantly uh, to get their injections. I mean, that is a risk to them. Uh, it's also a risk to the healthcare provider. Uh, but I, I, I have not really changed greatly what I've done. You look at the patient, you see what they're like, you look at their performance status, you understand what their social situation is like, what their exposure risks are, and then I think you deal accordingly. Yeah, I think that's so well said, Dan. It's what it still makes, you know, the art of medicine, right? We can never, you know, be so uh, uh, dogged because uh, you, you still have to sit knee to knee with the patient and understand what their needs are. I know we're pushing up on time. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, gentlemen, you know, thank you so much. Thanks for all that you do. I, you know, uh, you're phenomenal and the research that you're doing. And I know that your institutions are amazing, and we're all looking forward to getting uh, our additional trials up and going, uh, clearly in geo-oncology, but also now as you're doing, Petros, and Ben, and Dan, and, and, and we're doing as well, how we interplay with this, this pandemic, and, and frankly, for you know, the, the anticipation that we will have other possible uh, pandemics, I think this will, be, will certainly be much better prepared. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 we had some questions. I didn't really have time to get to them because the conversation was fantastic. And I really appreciate everything that you all have, have said today. Uh, I do want to just close by, uh, again, thanking everybody for, for joining. Um, I, I hope that um, the folks who, who listened, and if they want to come back and listen to it again, um, they can they can go on to the the BioAscend uh, uh, site just to promote some additional things going on. There will be three additional webinars are planned uh, uh, for BioAscend on hematological malignancies on June 9th, lung cancer on June 10th, and gynecologic malignancies on June 11th. 
and the registration is is open at bioascend.com slash COVID-19. So uh, with that, uh, as, as we, you know, are getting fond of saying every, you know, stay, stay, stay healthy, stay safe, but I think we have to add to, to stay happy and enjoy some of the nicer weather and uh, look forward to seeing you all live at, 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 at a, a safer point in time. But thanks, everybody.